I want to start by thanking everyone for taking the time out of their night to join us this evening. While we would absolutely prefer to see each and every one of you in person, we are very thankful of the many ways that we can all remain connected virtually. Uh, for those of you who I have not yet had the pleasure of meeting, my name is Courtney Whitley, and I am our Director of Development and Alumni Affairs here at Castleton. I too am a proud member of our Castleton alumni community, class of 2013, and have worked at Castleton since the day I walked across the stage at commencement. Um, and I will be serving as tonight's moderator. Our alumni panel event this evening features three outstanding female graduates. Each have risen to become top talented professionals in their field and will be discussing their respective professional careers and life experiences. Tonight's speakers include Ali Flewelling, class of 2011, Ariel Delaney, class of 2007, and our keynote, Carol Ryan Surface, class of 1987. Tonight's event is part of Castleton's Women, Women's History Month, and we will provide some additional programming and other ways to support our Women's History Month initiatives in the chat for those who are interested. Throughout the event tonight, we will be taking live question submissions for, from our viewers, uh, which can be submitted through the Zoom function uh, anytime during tonight's programming. Uh, we will get to that at the end after all of our speakers give their presentations. We ask that all viewing participants remain muted and practice respectful and appropriate behavior throughout the duration of our event. Now on to our wonderful guests of honor this evening. It is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Allie Flewelling. Allie Flewelling is Communications Business Partnerships Manager at BAE Systems Electronic Systems, a global aerospace and defense company headquartered in Nashua, New Hampshire. In this role, she leads a team of executive communications professionals who serve as trusted advisors to the company's senior executives. Allie helps drive message alignment and strategic internal and external communication support for the sector's seven business areas spanning commercial and defense markets, which employ more than 15,000 employees across 26 sites. Allie, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Courtney, uh, and thanks to all the folks on the line. I'm really excited to be here tonight. Um, I'll just share a little bit about myself and want to spend some time, too, talking about my journey at Castleton. It certainly uh, holds a special place in my heart, as I know it does for probably most of you on the call tonight. Um, so I'm actually a Vermont native. I grew up in Pittsburgh, Vermont, um, which is about 30 minutes from Castleton. Um, so Castleton, even before I went there, it's always been a, a pretty big part of my life because even as a kid, I would spend time, you know, going over there for sporting events or different activities. Um, and it was just kind of that hometown college that uh, was an important part of the, the Rutland, uh, a greater Rutland community. I live in Nashua, New Hampshire currently, but I do try to get back to Vermont uh, whenever I can. It's, it's a very important place for me and in particular Castleton. Um, so I actually, I went to high school in Proctor, Vermont, um, at Proctor High School, and I graduated from there in 2007, um, a salutatorian in my class there, and actually as part of that, I was offered a scholarship to go to Castleton, um, and I opted to instead start my journey at the University of Vermont. I think initially, um, as a young adult, I had some reservations about going to the neighborhood uh, Castleton University or Castleton State College at the time. Um, and I think that was influencing my decision making. So I started off at UVM. And if any of you are familiar with Proctor, where I went to high school, it is a very small school. Um, and so I was immediately overwhelmed by not only the size of UVM, um, but also I, I was sitting there in the back of my mind, I had regretted not taking a scholarship that I got to go to Castleton. Um, so there's a lot to like about UVM, but I really found myself longing for the smaller class sizes, and I opted to go to Castleton, um, and I transferred there about halfway through my sophomore year, um, and I immediately was met with warm welcome from all of the faculty and staff. I actually started off as a, a music major, um, and it, I took one communications class at Castleton um, and I was immediately hooked um, and I actually changed my major. I minored in music, um, which is an important part of my life too, but um, I, tra I transferred into the comms department and kind of never looked back. I had a number of professors at Castleton who were instrumental in uh, shaping my journey um, at the college, but also uh, I think shaping where I am today. 
Um, so I actually would credit Castleton with um, preparing me for success as a communications professional. Um, the, the comms program at Castleton exposed me to all facets of communications during my degree program, including um, numerous areas that were outside of my comfort zone. I think for me, probably uh, the video aspects of comms are, you know, what I'm least familiar with. But man, was it nice to have somebody kind of encouraging you to still you know, see value in exploring those areas, even if that wasn't, you know, what you had your heart set on. Um, so in my curriculum, there's a number of different things I learned, script writing, public relations, journalism, video production, public speaking, um, and, and a lot more. Um, and I had, as I mentioned, several dedicated professors, some of whom are still teaching at Castleton today, um, and many were, you know, extremely supportive and found unique ways to instill pride in me. Um, but also I saw them do that for other students. And they really believed in us um, and sometimes believed in us when we didn't believe in ourselves. And so that was, you know, really in inspiring. I got a lot of practical experience um, working uh, or being part of the comms group at Castleton too. I actually wrote for the Castleton Spartan, the school newspaper. I still have uh, several hard copies that I hold on to because um, the stories that I wrote for that were really special. Um, and as part of that too, I also got to do some freelance work for the Rutland Herald. Um, and I remember actually it was one of my special moments when I was at Castleton, um, Dave Walk, who was president of Castleton at the time, called me and said, hey, I just got a call from the Rutland Herald and they're looking to write an article about the groundbreaking of our new dorms um, that were being built next to the football stadium. And he said, uh, Dave Blow, who's one of our journalism professors at Castleton, said you might be up for the job. And so I got to write that and it was my first byline uh, in the Rutland Herald, which was pretty cool. And that actually led me to do some freelance writing for them for the better part of like six or seven years. Um, and so I really credit Castleton with giving me that like real world practical experience that um, led me to my career in comms today. And honestly, it, I couldn't be more grateful for it because in the role that I'm in now at BAE Systems, as Courtney mentioned, I have a um, I have a team of seven comms professionals uh, under me, but our communications team at my company, um, we have about a team of about 80 people. And we have all of this like in-house communications work from video production to creating marketing collateral um, to helping our executives with their you know various uh, executive communications needs. But a lot of what we do requires us to, to come together um, on projects. And it's really important uh, when you're overseeing those types of projects to have a good understanding and foundation of what is communications and how do all those different pieces come together. Um, and Castleton really gave me that. Um, so certainly something I am grateful for. I often find myself reflecting on my time at Castleton. Uh, whether it was a lesson I learned from a professor or just an experience that I had there. Um, one of the other things I got out of my journey at Castleton, uh, too, was I had an internship at um, CVPS, which is now, uh, they were acquired by Green Mountain Power several years ago. Um, but I worked in the public affairs office there. Um, and I had uh, Steve Costello, who's actually risen the ranks in that organization, but he was kind of my mentor while I worked there as an intern. Um, and as somebody I've actually stayed in touch with over the years. Um, and, you know, he's he was really instrumental, I think, in helping me shape where I wanted to go next after I graduated from Castleton. But the, the really nice thing about that was like, there's these partnerships at a small college that you don't find somewhere else. So in this instance, one of my Castleton professors had a connection with CVPS and was able to identify this opportunity for me. Um, and there were stories like that, you know, kind of all, all happening all around the communications group at Castleton, but also in other parts of, um, of parts of the college where professors would find these opportunities um, to go above and beyond to help their students be successful. And that's a lesson I took from Castleton that I now try to 
instill in others that I meet, whether it's somebody on my team today um, or, you know, a student uh, from Castleton, you know, because that's really important having, I think, that foundation and having people who believe in you and will help advocate for you. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about my company as well. Um, as Courtney mentioned, I work at BAE Systems. We're a global aerospace and defense company. And one of the things I really enjoy about working at BAE is my company does really meaningful work uh, protecting our servicemen and women. And we have a purposeful mission, which is we protect those who protect us. Um, and it really drives myself and others at the company to bring our best foot forward. Um, we create technology, um, disruptive technology that helps really keep our nation's heroes safe and brings them home safely. Um, and that's such an important thing um, that I get to be a small part of. Um, and the other thing, my company is extremely invested in its people. And so I've been the recipient of that. Um, I've actually gotten to help start a young professionals network at the company. Um, and really it's a place where if you raise your hand, they're gonna give you that opportunity to do something. Um, and that's been the case for me. And honestly, it takes that little bit of confidence um, to, to know when it's okay to raise your hand sometimes, but I feel like Castleton gave me that confidence. Um, and so I, I'm not one to shy away from an opportunity when something comes up. And I think really in all of the curriculum and interactions I had with different folks along the way at Castleton, um, that's something that's really prepared me to feel comfortable and confident in my abilities as a communicator. Um, so that's been really nice. Uh, and then I'll just spend, I got a couple minutes left. I'll just talk a little bit about um, <clears throat> my personal life and my family. Um, so I mentioned I live in Nashua, New Hampshire. I'm actually engaged and I also have um, an eight-year-old stepson. Um, he was in second grade. So that's been really interesting with the pandemic. Um, but I am, I'm getting married in Vermont, actually in May of this year. I had to postpone from last year, um, but getting married in Manchester, Vermont. Um, so very much looking back, looking forward to uh, coming back to the Green Mountain State and I will certainly probably try to swing by and visit Castleton while I'm there. Um, but I, my parents are still in Vermont. Um, you know, th that's where I grew up. So it's such a special place to me. And uh, most of my family is still there as well. Um, so yeah, I, uh, you know, I, I treasure my time at Castleton. I thank you all for the opportunity to, to talk to you tonight. I look forward to some of your questions. Um, and thank you so much. Thank you so much, Allie. Um, again, a reminder for anybody who has any questions for Allie or any of our speakers, please continue to throw those out in the chat and we'll get to those as soon as we wrap up our speaker presentations. Uh, up next is Ariel Delaney. Ariel Delaney is a global health and international development practitioner with over 10 years experience. Currently, Ariel is a senior program coordinator for the financial services for the poor team at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation in Seattle, Washington. In this role, she manages a $40 million portfolio of investments aimed to expand the availability of affordable and reliable financial services that serve the needs of all, including the world's poorest. Ariel, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, it is wonderful to be back uh, with the Castleton audience. Uh, I want to first thank Carrie and Courtney for putting this event together and for inviting me. And uh, thanks as well to my co-speakers, who uh, I'm really grateful to be sitting on this panel with. Um, my time at Castleton was really transformational for me. Um, I, was, I spent my summers in Vermont as a child, half my family um, is our Vermonters. And um, I, you know, there's so much to love about the environment in Vermont and, and how it nurtures us as, as human beings. Um, but I moved full time when I was a teenager to Vermont and I, I attended uh, Bishop Rice High School in South Burlington, Vermont. Um, and when the time came to attend college or to apply for colleges rather, I really didn't think twice about applying for schools in Vermont because I knew I wanted to stay in the environment uh, to have it nurture me. And I, I should say that I 
Castleton wasn't my number one choice, but um, I'll explain a little bit further uh, why I stayed and, and why I love uh, the environment so much. So I want to share for all of, especially for all of the young women out there, particularly any women of color that may be on the call, some of the lessons that I, that Castleton taught me um, in my journey and how um, it, it has guided me and still stays with me uh, through the lens of inspirational quotes. And I love uh, a good a good inspirational quote. So the first one is that the, long, the longest journey starts with a single step. Um, I was a first generation college student and I, like many students, I didn't feel ready for school when I started. Uh, my first week, I remember contemplating dropping out of school. I walked down to the general store where there was a pay phone um, back in the olden days. And uh, I remember calling home saying, you know, I really, this isn't for me. You know, I don't think I can hack it. I'm not smart enough to be here. And I remember the response was, we'll give it a semester and see if you want, still want to come home after a semester, you can come home. And in walking back, uh, uh, Professor Thomas Conroy, who happened to also be my advisor, stopped me and he said, are you okay? And I said, nope. And I proceeded to bawl in front of him about my apprehension and, and the hardest week I had had on campus so far. And I remember him um, sitting down with me and discussing you know, my past at Castleton and how he would help support me get to where I wanted to go. And, and similar um, to what was that what Ali mentioned earlier, you know, just that nurturing spirit that all of the Castleton professors had that they really wanted me to succeed. Um, and they cared about my success because it was their success as well. So the second quote I have is, friendships can be found in unlikely places if you are open to them. Um, Castleton brings so many different people together, different social economic classes. Um, I understand now there's a greater racial diversity on campus than there was when I was there, which is amazing. I'm really proud of Castleton for going on that journey. Um, but a lot of the work that you do with all of these folks that you bring from all over Vermont and the region um, is really important because a lot of the work that we do nowadays is collaborative work. I work on a team of, of strategy planning and management with five other people. And you have to learn how to work with other people, even though you may not approach your work the same way, but you have to get things done together. Castleton exposed me to so many different people that I had to learn to work with on group projects um, and in clubs and in activities as a student athlete. And that collaborative work really just is a lesson that started me on this trajectory in my career and it continues to guide me. I'll also say that some of my best friends, and I can count them on my hand, um, the majority of them are from my time at Castleton. It's just a great place where you get to meet so many different people um, and staying open to those experiences. The next quote I have is, uh, it's not about the destination, it's about the journey. I remember the week before graduation, I had this nightmare that I was one credit short of graduating and that there was going to be something that got in the way of me graduating. And it really uh, got me thinking about all of the, the hardships of the, the past four years, all of the hurdles that I had to climb through academically, socially, emotionally, and it, that journey of resiliency is something that serves me today whenever I'm going through really hard times at work or even in my personal life, I know that I can get through something because I've gotten through, you know, I have that muscle memory of going through something uh, that was hard for me, but I got through it. And I think that, you know, those lessons you learn are lifelong, lifelong building blocks. The next quote I have is, you never, you can never expect to succeed if you only put in work on the days you feel like it. Um, life is demanding. And one lesson I have learned is that you have to learn to work, plan your work and work your plan. And Castleton definitely taught me that. I was a student athlete. I was on a number of clubs. I also wrote for the Spartans. Um, and I had a lot of interest, but I also needed to learn how to study. <laughs> And study time is really important. And I didn't know what that was initially. So you have to learn to build a schedule and really uh, make sure that you have uh, the time you know, established. So creating a good schedule is something that Castleton just taught me. And I use it again every week of my life. I still use the same methodology that I learned at Castleton. Uh, the next lesson I have is when you're curious, you find uh, lots of interesting things to do. 
one thing I feel about the ecosystem of Castleton is that there are so many clubs, there's so many um, student athletics, there's so much to get involved in. You just have a really good opportunity to, to get your feet wet in something. And um, I learned how to be a critical thinker because of my involvement in, in clubs and exposing myself in conversations with people, how to be an analytical thinker. And again, those are skills that I continue to use every day. And I wouldn't have gotten that if I hadn't been in that ecosystem. So I really appreciate it now looking back just how much uh, student body, like how much we really try to engage um, students in many different ways. Um, and it's for our, it has been for, and my, my experience has been for my, my betterment. Um, and then the last one I'll leave is that um, being true to yourself. So Castleton, as I said earlier, is transformational. It brought out the best in me. Um, many times you'll have decisions in life and professional life specifically where you have to say, oh, do I take this position because it'll better my career, but I'm really not interested in what the work does. Um, those these like career ultimatums and Castleton taught me to be true to myself. And I say that because when I uh, was applying for colleges, I had never intended to stay at Castleton. I said I was going to stay for two years and then just leave, go to a different school. If I if I made it, I would go to somewhere else that was bigger or um, more notable. And I stayed because I uh, felt I put so much into that journey. Castleton had put so much into me. I was thriving and I was at my best and I didn't want to interrupt that thriving. So it just taught me to be true to my own decisions. And sometimes the best the best thing for you are to stay where you are rather than going ahead. So I really just want to thank y'all for the opportunity and I'm looking forward to answering questions. Um, and also while I have this opportunity, I know some folks on the call, um, I wanted to just thank y'all for having the impact you have had on my life and that you continue, I know that you continue to have on other students' lives because it's with your nurture and your care that your students can thrive in their environment and then beyond. Thank you. Over. Thank you so much, Ariel. That was wonderful. Um, again, anybody who has questions for any of our speakers tonight, please continue to throw those out in the chat and we will get to those in just a little bit. Um, up next, I am so happy to introduce our keynote speaker, Carol Ryan Surface. Carol Ryan Surface joined Medtronic in September 2013 as Senior Vice President and Chief Human Resources Officer. She leads Medtronic's humans, Human Resources Strategy for over 90,000 employees worldwide. She also provides leadership for global communications, philanthropy, and Medtronic Labs, and serves as the board chair for the Medtronic Foundation. Key focus areas include organizational transformation, enterprise talent management and succession planning, leadership development, inclusion and diversity, executive compensation, reputation management, and community and health initiatives. Carol, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Courtney, and uh, really thank you again for the invitation and to join the group here this evening. I think, you know, Ollie and, and Ariel really teed up some common themes here that you're going to hear me reinforce, which is what a pivotal experience um, Castleton was for me and just how important and how influential the professors at Castleton were in, in my life. So I think that's really something that you've carried on uh, truly through the decades, given my tenure at Castleton was much, much, much earlier and much earlier uh, than Ariel and, and Allie. So um, it, truthfully, uh, when I think about Castleton, it, it really was the gateway to a life and a career that I honestly would never have expected, but I'll get to that in a bit later. So um, today, as you heard from Courtney, I'm the Chief Human Resources Officer at Medtronic, and I'm based here in Minneapolis, which is where the company was founded back in 1949. And uh, many, our, Medtronic isn't necessarily a household name or a consumer brand name, but I would tell you that our products and our therapies improve the lives of two people every second. And if you know someone with a, with a pacemaker or with diabetes or who's had surgery, it's very possible that in fact, uh, Medtronic or Medtronic product or therapy has touched their life and uh, maybe some of yours. Um, so at, at this point, we've got 
95,000 employees, and we're in about 150 countries around the world, so very much um, a global business. And um, while I never envisioned working in healthcare, frankly, I'll, I'll get to that part of my story later, um, because it does underscore that sometimes the best experiences just aren't part of the plan. And that's also how I would characterize my time at Castleton and a, and a theme of my story here tonight. So, all right, the first chapter of my story was I had a plan and it wasn't to be a chief human resources officer. So I know you're thinking, I'm, I'm kidding, right? Doesn't every child and young adult just grow up and dream of a career in human resources? All right, well, maybe not. But if I had known that a career in human resources would actually take me to more than 60 countries, including um, living and working outside of the U.S. for seven years, then actually maybe I would have dreamed of this particular career. Um, but in fact, my long-held aspiration couldn't be more different. In fact, I had planned to build a career, a professional career in classical ballet. And I started dancing probably when I was five years old, uh, spawned vividly by uh, watching a ballet performance. It was probably the Nutcracker, maybe it was something else, but it was performed on our local PBS channel. I grew up in Vermont, I grew up in Rutland, and um, I just remember you know, watching that PBS special being mesmerized, and that was what I wanted to do come hell or high water, frankly. Um, and, and that performance drew me in because of the way it made me feel it, it, I could see the dancers were doing this very gracefully. It looked very easily, uh, but I figured there was probably more to it. A lot of hard work that enabled that. And so that, um, inspiration, I guess, and aspiration really drove me for, for a number of years. And I started training in earnest um, with the hope of at least perhaps becoming a member of the corps de ballet in a ballet company. And my parents supported my dream, uh, but likely with reservations. And they had a specific ground rule if I was going to pursue this thing. And, and I absolutely had to adhere to it. And that was I could pursue this classical ballet thing. Um, and I was expected to get a college education and earn a degree. And there are plenty of universities with an academic foundation in the arts, which serve as a wonderful training ground for many accomplished dancers. So I didn't think this was entirely a bad idea. Uh, but now in hindsight, I realized that they were engineering my plan B just in case the ballet thing didn't work out. What great vision they had. So along with a couple of friends, I auditioned at the State University of New York at Purchase, uh, Point Park then was college, now university in Pittsburgh and a few others. And so I landed at Point Park with one of my friends uh, from Rutland, actually, and pursued my dream for a year. So I thought, you know, I was putting my plan in action. I was doing all the right things. But over the course of that year, I really uh, began to see kind of the cracks and the flaws in this grand plan that I, that I thought I had. Um, so, you know, to kind of state the obvious, performing uh, ballet or any profession uh, physically, athlete, you know, if you're an athlete, dancer, it doesn't matter, certainly requires a level of passion uh, clearly a level of interest, dedication, but most importantly, skill. Um, I had all of those things, but perhaps at a different level. And what I learned in my year in Pittsburgh was, you know, it was just, it was a different level, put simply. And for the first time in my life, after growing up in, in Vermont, I was really a small fish in a much bigger pond. The competition was much more significant. But importantly, I had a front row seat to, to observe and experience the real challenges of the profession that, that I believe, frankly, still exist today, which is people struggle um, in that profession emotionally, physically, psychologically. And, and frankly, it was pretty unsettling for me. And, and I 
stopped and I asked myself, was this something that I really wanted? Was this really my plan A? And that, that whole year at Point Park in Pittsburgh gave me pause. And I really found myself questioning, did I want to be that small fish in a bigger pond? Would it satisfy my ambition? Um, was I good enough? honestly, to compete at this different level. And I stepped back and, and the next thing that I did was absolutely nowhere in my grand plan. And that was returning home to Vermont. And I needed to figure out what I was going to do next. Do I return to Pittsburgh to continue pursuing, you know, this dream of mine? Or do I really need to come up with a new plan? So the next few months, let's just say, were a bit challenging. I spent a lot of time reflecting on, you know, the future I wanted versus what's realistic and what makes sense. And um, while my parents may have thought of a plan B for me, I hadn't really thought of that plan B. Maybe it was in the back of my mind, but I wasn't willing to admit it. Um, so suffice it to say, I had to think about a plan B. And I thought about where I had interests and um, one of which was in psychology, frankly, based solely on a high school level introductory course. I went to MSJ or Mount St. Joseph Academy. And um, my family also lived pretty close to, uh, to Castleton. And um, I was very relieved, again, you know, the foresight of my parents uh, to learn that all of my credits would transfer to Castleton, all of them. Um, so I declared a major in psychology and ended up also with a minor arts and minor in theater arts, given all of the uh, dance credits from Point Park. So I continued to dance at, in, at Castleton, but certainly out of passion and not the, the plan A uh, career uh, aspiration that I once had. So, you know, like what you heard from others, attending Castleton wasn't necessarily in my plan, but it was the result of my plans not going as expected. And it turned out truly to be one of the most pivotal experiences of my life and opened up doors that never would have been opened to me. Um, as a result of the help and the support of the community of professors and one in particular, um, who was Kurt Bartol, who was my psychology professor, and he was best known, and is best known for his work in forensic psychology. And um, he was a clinical psychologist, uh, uh, served as a consulting police psychologist and to many municipalities and federal law agencies and published a number of books on the topic. And I was really fortunate to be one of his students because like you heard from, from Allie and Ariel, um, you know, the professors at Castleton really care and invest time and in their students and, and want to see them be successful. Um, and so what I learned from him was, you know, I really need to understand what psychology is all about, but I really wasn't sure what I was going to do <laughs> with psychology and how my career was going to unfold. The notion of being a clinical psychologist, frankly, just didn't resonate with me. I thought what he did, forensic psychology, was also interesting. But then, you know, I learned you had to pursue both a JD and a PhD. And I was like, I don't know that I'm up for that. Um, but I wasn't sure what the, what the options were. And so one summer, I spent time, I was doing an internship in Boston um, in a business environment. And I remember thinking, well, I wonder if there's some way, some application of psychology in the workplace. And well, lest you forget, the internet didn't exactly exist back then. So I couldn't just Google, is there an intersection between psychology and workplace? So I had to wait and, you know, trudge back to Vermont. And by the time I got on campus, um, you know, I asked Dr. Bartol this question and was actually pleased, frankly shocked, that there was indeed a field for, for this, and it was called industrial organizational psychology. And lucky for me, uh, he was actually teaching an, uh, an introductory course that fall and told me to enroll and see what I thought of it. But he said, you know, you're, let me just forewarn you, you need to have uh, kind of a knack for analytics and statistics. And if you wanted to pursue the field, then, you know, you probably need to 
earn maybe a master's degree or a PhD. Um, I was like, okay, well, well, you know, let's, let's see how this goes. And I liked the course. I figured, okay, why not? And then he helped me figure out that um, there were schools. I mean, he invested a bunch of time with me to say, here are a list of schools that you could consider to pursue graduate school and be forewarned that, you know, some schools just have a PhD program. And if you don't finish, you walk away with nothing, not even a master's degree, but other schools have a terminal master's degree program, which you would get a degree. And if you want to go on and get your doctorate, you can do that. So very educational. I'm not sure I would have figured that out on my own. So I took his advice and long story short, ended in Michigan at Central Michigan University. And I remember him just coaching me and telling me that, you know, don't think of this as just earning a degree. Um, and he talked about how uh, graduate programs, um, oftentimes you're, you're working in much smaller groups of people. And while it's a very, um, maybe stressful would be the word, uh, program many times, you're also going to leave, uh, learn and, and probably meet some of lifelong friends that, um, that will be lasting relationships. And honestly, he couldn't have been more right. Graduate school didn't only lead me to Michigan, but it also introduced me to a fellow psychology student, clinical psychology student named Luke, who later became my husband. And we got married uh, while we were both earning our doctorates. And we'll celebrate our 29th wedding anniversary um, this year. And when when I was in Michigan, I also met um, two outstanding mentors, Dan and Linda King, who are the ones who encouraged me not just to kind of stop after getting the master's degree, uh, but encouraged me to support my my and pursue the PhD. And and frankly, you know, without their encouragement, support, I don't think I would have had the confidence to say, okay, I'll stick with it. Because I was asking myself, can I do it? Am I smart enough? You know, the crisis of confidence that I think many women oftentimes had uh, have. And I'll, fo I'll foreshadow for you here that I think another theme of my story this evening is that I never would have had the confidence to pursue uh, what I've done in my life and in my career without the counsel of many wise mentors, professors, and leaders first extending their confidence in me and the potential that I had. Um, and I would guess that I'm probably not the only woman who would say this or who at times in their life and career have suffered from uh, the well-known imposter syndrome. Um, but I do think, you know, while our plans may never work out as we hope, they definitely lead us to places and to people that we were meant to find all along. That was certainly true for me. And it all started at Castleton. And so, you know, my hope for, for many people, if you're, you're still in school there, that, you know, 20 or 10 or 20 or 30 years from now, you'll look back and reflect on how special your time was at Castleton and find that it was as pivotal for you as, as you've heard it was for, for me and Ariel and, and Ollie this evening. Um, and then there's a, you know, another chapter of my story, uh, which is after earning my doctorate, my plan was, you know, pretty straightforward. I had a plan and I'm going to use that education, PhD in industrial psych organizational psychology to pursue that. And um, following a nudge uh, from yet another boss and mentor at another organization, um, who I'll call Dr. J, I was very pleased to have the opportunity to join PepsiCo International and apply my degree to a very specialized role in organization and talent and development. And with that, I thought, honestly, I had died and God to heaven, a real live paying job um, after years of eating Kraft macaroni and cheese as a graduate student. And it was a well-known, well-respected company. <laughs> I thought, this is it. This is great. Done. And what I didn't know at the time is that uh, PepsiCo would serve as yet another kind of portal to life and career that I never would have imagined. And it too was fueled by people and leaders and mentors and sponsors who saw something in me and gave me confidence to try things that I wouldn't have, honestly, on my own. And so I was told after a couple of years of joining that I had become pretty good at my job and um, 
you know, even though I felt I was very happy just to continue doing what I was doing, um, you know, others had said, well, you know, maybe just keep, keep an open mind, keep an open mind that you could be doing something else. Having a plan for your career is great, but, you know, be willing to adjust it. And I said, okay, fine. So then all of a sudden, this woman who is my manager's manager um, um, came to me, expressed her confidence in me and said, hey, I've got an idea for you. Two things. One, I think you should take a much broader role than what you're doing in, in human resources. And two, I think you should take this much broader role um, and move to Hong Kong and um, lead human resources for our China biv uh, business. So again, I never would have had the confidence or it would never have entered my mind growing up in Rutland, Vermont, that I should move to Hong Kong at some point in the future. So Ronnie expressing this confidence in me and, and planning the idea, obviously the decision to go was massive. It meant my husband, Luke, who was now a practicing clinical psychologist would need to sell his private practice uh, lock, stock, and barrel, and we, we'd need to move to a place that he, frankly, had never been to. And I would be leaving what I thought was the comfort of a technical career path and domain expertise that I had worked very hard to secure. Um, so here we go. Off we go. Moving to Hong Kong in 2003, and then later to Dubai in the United Arab Emirates were absolutely never a part of my life or career plan, I assure you of that. However, uh, when we moved first to Hong Kong, every dimension of life, as you can imagine, was different. I felt, you know, professionally and personally upside down, um, out of my comfort zone, getting very uncomfortable and being a student again in every aspect of life and culture uh, was what was unfolding. So then complicating things even further. This is three weeks into uh, the early part of 2003 in Hong Kong. And um, weeks after we arrived, the severe acute respiratory syndrome known as SARS epidemic broke out with patient zero in Hong Kong and began to spread across Hong Kong, China, Asia, and beyond, but didn't become a pandemic. And now, <laughs> even more relevant after we've all lived through the COVID-19 pandemic over the past year. You can imagine uh, just this unusual event uh, being very personally and professionally stressful, as you can imagine. And, and now I was tasked with leading the team and the organization through this epidemic, through this crisis, and figure out how to keep our 12,000 employees in China safe and healthy, which we did. But I had no experience, absolutely none. Uh, and frankly, Luke and I questioned many times, did we make the right decision in moving to Hong Kong? What I could not have known, despite the foreshadowing from the WHO and CDC uh, in 2003, was that this experience was preparing me for something much bigger. And it came 17 years later in the form of the pandemic that we've been living through for the past year. What I've been doing at Medtronic over the past year, among other things, has been leading our COVID response to support our 95,000 employees at Medtronic. And those lessons that I learned years ago in Hong Kong were merely preparation and training wheels and a rehearsal for what was yet to come here in 2020. And so one of the most important things that I took away from my experience in Hong Kong is this notion of being uncomfortable is a good thing because that's when you're learning, that's when you're growing, and that's when you're developing. And, you know, I really had to let go of my thinking of being the know-it-all and uh, being the domain expert and learning agility really only comes from repeatable experiences where you don't always get it right. And there's very little that will develop you faster than when you're put into a situation that you haven't managed or dealt with before. Um, and you know what? It's just being ready for the unexpected, sometimes in the form of a crisis that really allows you to kind of take it the next step forward. And that, that has happened to me time and time again. Um, so after my five years in Hong Kong, and, and it was a great five years, despite those unsettling uh, first several months, 
in 2003. I repatriated to the U.S. and to take on my dream job at PepsiCo, leading the human resources organization for all of their businesses outside of the U.S. It was my mentor's 40, former job. Her name was Ronnie. Um, and it was very aspirational. It was my dream job. But yet again, things didn't go as I expected. Um, so what happened was, uh, well, first of all, I'll say just as a leader, right, you are expected first and foremost to do what is right for the company, for the organization. And in this case, I was sitting in my dream job, eliminating my dream job, the one I had planned for and worked hard for during a reorganization, because that's what we needed to do to realign the organization to support PepsiCo strategy. So as you would imagine, it was incredibly disappointing at the time. Um, and so my next move included a relocation to Dubai a mere nine months after repatriating to the United States. So it felt like a step backward. I was doing a job in Dubai that combined uh, supporting Asia Pacific and Middle East Africa, but I had already done the Asia Pacific job before, after my, my post in, in China. Um, so like my move to Hong Kong, this was an unplanned move, but it felt like it was taking me a step backward. But what I didn't know is that it was really setting me up for the next move, for the next step in my career. And it taught me that disappointment and, and adversity can lead to the best and most unexpected things. I just didn't know it at the time. So I was recruited to become the chief human resources officer at Best Buy based here in Minneapolis. And <laughs> this, this chapter of my story is fondly referred to as moving from the fire into the freezer from a climate perspective. <laughs> Some of you, I, you know, hey, I grew up in Vermont, so I'm pretty hardy. And I thought, yeah, all states that border Canada must be created equal. Not true. This place gets like minus 40 degree, minus 50 degree temperatures in the winter. So that it's like, yeah, nothing compared to Vermont. So anyway, here I am uh, 11 years later after that move from Dubai. And I, I know I'm repeating myself when I say, you know, when I started my studies at Castleton, I, I could never have imagined I'd be the chief human resources officer of not one, but two Fortune 500 companies. But here I am. I would say my experience in all of those uh, trials and tribulations, crises, epidemics, uh, Asian tsunamis have prepared me for uh, the jobs that I have today. And um, all of those experiences kind of led me to where I am today. And all of a sudden this opportunity came along called Medtronic. And while I thought my experiences in consumer products and retail industries didn't really have a match for Medtronic, um, all of that global experience and, and operating in emerging markets really did prepare me for this experience at Medtronic. And um, I've over the past eight years since I've been here, I've done a lot of things that I was never planning on doing, but it all kind of came together uh, that where I've been uniquely prepared with the support and help of so many mentors and sponsors over the years. So I guess, um, you know, in my, my closing thoughts, as we continue to grow and develop and mature in our, our lives and our careers, sometimes the things that we heard at a, at a young age really often stick with us. And I, I wanted to share one uh, with you here this evening. Um, and it was a conversation with my father when I was in high school. And I don't even know what I wanted at the particular point in time, um, uh, but I you know, was going on about something that I wanted or thought I needed. And my, my father looked at me jokingly and said, well, you better marry a wealthy man with all the things that you want. And literally without, this is granted, this is, this is like in the early 1980s. And just sort of instinctively, not having a plan and without missing a beat, I just said, well, maybe I'll be successful, dad. Did you ever think of that? <laughs> I don't have to marry someone. Um, and, and, you know, in retrospect, <laughs> gee, that probably wasn't going to happen on a ballet dancer's salary. But anyway, my, my point is that, you know, hard work will certainly get you far. 
it'll get you recognized. And sometimes the doors to life and the future you dream of get, get opened up uh, no matter what. And you know what? Now young women are told they can do anything and they can be anything. And I think, you know, now there's, we've got a pretty important proof point with a woman of color, uh, the first woman and first woman of color being the vice president of the United States is certainly a proof point. So, um, you know what? Uh, I think we all need resilience to be prepared for the things that uh, that don't come, we don't plan on, and, and a lot comes our way. Uh, but I guess being open to what the universe sometimes throws you is is critical. And just you know, when our plans go awry, um, just you know, have some faith that we sometimes stumble into greater opportunities and much greater gifts as an op- as uh, one of the the benefits of that. So while uh, my passion or your passion may not become your career, you can certainly in- embrace it as a lifelong hobby and so hopefully something that brings you joy. Um, and the people you meet can become mentors and sponsors and, and lifelong friends. And I absolutely I wouldn't be here without so many people who have given me advice over the years. Um, and while the job you wanted may escape you, uh, sometimes adversity and those challenges can open even better doors and lead to places beyond your imagination, like I've shared with you here this evening. Um, so I continue to remain open and excited about many unplanned adventures that I hope are in, in store for me. And um, I hope you're excited about some unplanned adventures post this pandemic that you're looking forward to. So I really appreciate, again, the invitation and, uh, and thank you for listening to One Woman's My Story this evening. Thanks again, Courtney. Thank you so much, Carol. And thank you to Allie and Ariel, um, all of you for sharing your careers and your professional journeys uh, since graduating Castleton. Um, we're now gonna open things up to the audience and take some questions. A reminder to all of our viewers uh, that if you have any burning questions for any of our speakers tonight, uh, please feel free to submit them via the, Ju- the Zoom chat function. We do already have some really great questions in. Um, The first one is for Carol. Uh, You mentioned you've done several um, work opportunities abroad. Um, Is that something that you'd consider doing again? Um, And what has been your favorite place to work? Well, you know, um, lots of great experiences of living and and working outside of the United States. And um, I, I really do struggle with favorite questions, whether it's music, whether it's movies, whether it's food. Ah, I'm just not a favorite person. (laughs) There are uh, just, I have so many fond memories of the places that I've worked, the countries I've traveled to, all have a unique, um, just endearing aspect to to whatever it is, whether it's, it's China, whether it's India, whether it's PepsiCo, whether it's Best Buy, whether it's Medtronic, there are wonderful things about each one of the companies uh, uh, that I've been at. Probably the thing that's been um, in common across all of those companies, it's always about the people, right? And that's, those are some of the stories that you've heard tonight, which is the, the, the professors and the support system and the network and dedication of the team and the, the professors and the staff at, at Castleton. So not unlike that, um, you know, it's the people across all of the different companies and the countries that I've been exposed to that are the favorites. Always great people, no matter where you go. Absolutely, thank you, Carol. And you actually alluded a little bit to the next question. Uh, You've worked in many high level positions for well-known companies. Which position have you found most challenging throughout your career in human resources? Um, Maybe maybe one I was asked to, you know, a few years ago, and this, uh, I guess it was probably five years ago uh, now to, you know, provide leadership for a part of our business called uh, Medtronic Labs. And, and Ariel, you're, you're probably more suited to, to this than, than I would have been, but uh, Medtronic Labs is like a social business and it is set up to um, remove uh, barriers to healthcare particularly in emerging markets and with underserved populations around the world. And, you know, this is, this is not my area of expertise, 
and so it was a very new and and different challenge for me. And and obviously there's a, a very talented leader um, who has experience and and knows how to do this work. It's probably been, uh, you know, just again incredibly eye opening around uh, the need to create care pathways for um, underserved patients around the world and create access. Uh, we take a lot for granted in developed markets and. Um, you know, there are a lot of people that, that just don't have access to some of the, the healthcare technology or resources that we have, especially in the United States. So it's, um, it, it's been challenging, but it's also been incredibly rewarding and in, in tracking, you know, the number of patients that we've been able to, to impact and provide access to. So very different than, you know, the educational training that I had and, and certainly my um, broader profession in human resources, but couldn't be more gratifying because it does impact people. Absolutely. Thank you, Carol. Um, the next question is for Allie. Can you walk us through a typical day um, in your position at BAE? Yeah, sure. Um, I would say that's a tough one to answer because every day is a little bit different. Um, but much like some of what Carol's talking about, we, I think like many corporations have been in the thick of the COVID-19 pandemic and our communications team has been pretty instrumental um, and played a significant role in making sure that we um, adequately communicate to our employees when we have either people on site um, who have, who have COVID-19 um, or any site closures or things like that. Um, so that's actually been a really interesting and tricky situation to navigate, just given all of the locations that we have. Um, and there's a lot of stakeholders involved um, and even something as simple as sending out a memo um, to inform uh, a group of employees about, you know, a, a COVID outbreak at a site or something like that. Um, it can involve, you know, multiple stakeholders to get approvals on that. And my team uh, will often be the ones who help uh, navigate that with our various um, executives um, and the different stakeholders involved. So uh, that's one of the things I do. But also, um, I think, you know, my team's involved in a number of activities. One that's been a big one for us this year is my company also acquired, had two major acquisitions. Um, and we were very intimately involved in all of the communications elements around that. Um, so everything from uh, working really closely with AHR to help onboard employees, um, but make them feel part of the company, but then also um, helping them to transition uh, their capabilities and technologies over. Um, so it can really, it kind of spans the gamut. There's a little bit of everything depending on the day. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, and the next question is for Ariel. Um, can you elaborate a little more on your team and what you do in your role at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation? Sure. Thank you, Courtney. As you mentioned earlier, so I work on the financial services for the poor team. Um, we are a team that's housed under the Global Growth and Opportunity Division of the Gates Foundation. And our, our goal is to help gain, help poor people get access to digital financial services. And by that, I mean having, having a digital bank account, having opportunity to send money and receive money digitally. And the specific uh, focus in my portfolio is women's economic empowerment and financial inclusion. We know that there's a gender gap in financial services. And unfortunately, in, in uh, the global south, um, it's much wider for women. Uh, as many women don't, own, don't have cell phones or they have to go to, some, to someone else, a family member has been to use a cell phone um, to send or uh, receive money. And so my portfolio is mostly um, dealing with uh, working with our partners uh, in, in this fight to make sure we can create uh, infrastructure in place, uh, create uh, innovation so that we can actually reach uh, women and hopefully get them to use the services and drive, drive that usage. And we believe it's a system-based uh, approach because there's a saying that we have is that um, if you build a system uh, for just in general, uh, assume that it's a male-based system, that it's not, it's not keeping in mind the needs of women in terms of how uh, we use technology and how we propel it. So um, that's basically like the overview of, of my team. And I want to say that 
some bigger currents at the Gates Foundation that we're really focused on now at an, at an institution level. So we are focused on uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, not just internally as an as a organizational institutional focus, it's external too. A lot of philanthropic dollars, if you do an analysis, um, are they're mostly going to institutions in the global north. They're not going to institutions that are based in the developing world. So we are trying to uh, implement uh, at, the, at the Gates Foundation um, a, a plan so that we can start diverting those resources and not just funding um, you know, global north institutions so that the, the equity uh, is, is at hand for, for, uh, for local based solutions to the problems that we're trying to solve. Over. Thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, the next question relates to professional development and I'll open this up to all three of our speakers. Uh, what motivates you to continue to grow and advance within your career? Uh, Carol, would you like to start? Sure, and thanks for the question, uh, Courtney. Um, I think what's always motivate, motivated me is just to have an impact and um, on people's lives and to provide, and, and obviously, you know, doing that in, in human resources and kind of giving back to, to people the way I received such great, sage, wise counsel from so many people um, starting at Castleton is something that I certainly get energy from and is motivating for me. And then again, you know, in reference to um, some of the different parts of what I'm doing now that are beyond human resources and, and referencing the social business called Medtronic Labs, that's a different impact. It's impacting uh, lives, you know, tens of thousands of lives outside of Medtronic, uh, particularly among underserved uh, populations in emerging markets. So just that, like, in short, ability to have an impact through other people on people's lives is incredibly uh, rewarding and motivating. Thank you so much. Allie, any thoughts from you about professional development um, and remaining active in your field? Yeah, sure. I I definitely resonate with um, what Carol just shared, but I think the other thing that's for personally for me is um, just showing up to, to try to be my best self every day. And I think the only way that you can do that is if you take inspiration from the people around you who are striving to learn and grow. Um, but also, you know, just, just to kind of make sure that, you know, whatever your role is, it's important and to make sure that you're showing up and being present and being your best self. Um, that for me is, is my motivation to continue to, to learn new things. And the other piece of that is there was a while after I graduated from Castleton where I was searching for opportunities in the communications field and there wasn't really one available. And so I, I always found little pockets of opportunity to continue to hone my craft in communications while I was waiting for that opportunity. So I really resonated with um, the story that Carol shared about just kind of, you know, that opportunity might not be there when you want it or when you think you need it, but it finds you eventually. Um, and so if you're, if you're constantly learning and trying to grow, um, that will help you to know when to take that jump when when you're presented with an opportunity. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Ali. Uh, Ariel, any thoughts from you? Yeah, I, I always say to myself, you don't know what you don't know. And when it comes to professional development, I I, I take the, the lens of just continuing my growth and getting those opportunities, whether it be taking a, a course, um, I'm going to be enrolling soon in a certificate course um, uh, to help better my analytical skills. Uh, and so I think that it's just finding those opportunities. And I also will say that there have been times where, you know, I have a, a, a wide variety of skills where in, in the role that I'm working in, I may not have been able to use them. And I've been able to use those skills in other ways. So um, I consult as well, in addition to my role at the Gates Foundation. And I have found that and I have done consulting since 2016. It's been a great opportunity for me because um, I'm not always able to use all the skills I have in one role, but I want to develop them. I want to keep them, right? So I use those skills to consult. And I, I, didn't, I didn't think holistically about how to use and professional, use my, my skills as professional development until 
Um, I, I realized that I, I was afraid I was going to lose some of the building blocks of what I learned at Castleton, you know, when I took some of my comp, my comp classes in terms of like me writing a press release, releasing it. Um, and I wanted to continue to practice those skills. And so that's one way in which I've been able to do it. And I think it's imperative that um, folks today use those multidimensional skill sets um, in ways to enhance their careers. Over. Could not agree more. Thank you so much, Ariel. Another one for all of our panelists, and I'll actually go right back to Ariel with this one. Uh, outside of work, what hobbies, activities, or community engagement do you participate in and enjoy most? So I remember when I was at campus and I joined the outing club because I really wanted to be out in, in nature. And I'm fortunate to live in the Pacific Northwest, which it does rain quite often. However, um, it drives everybody outside. Hiking trails are always full here, and I enjoy being outdoors, um, experiencing nature uh, with my family. Um, I have a four-year-old daughter, and I really just love uh, connecting with nature here. Uh, it's very different from Vermont. I really wish we had a little, some days we get a little bit of Vermont, but it's only like once or twice a year. Um, but that's one thing it has in common is like a beautiful landscape, and I, I, I can't get enough of it. Over. Thank you so much, Ariel. Carol, how about you? Yeah, um, I, I guess I would describe it as anything, you know, kind of active and, and fitness related, um, some of which uh, kind of harkens back to my, my mini career <laughs> in classical ballet. Um, while I've kind of hung up my point shoes and ballet slippers, uh, you know, taking bar classes virtually now, of course, or Pilates is something that I like to do. And uh, growing up in Vermont, I did downhill ski uh, a lot. So that's something that I continue to do to this day and um, have taken up paddle boarding over the past five years, which is sort of a, a good exercise and, and zen at the same time. So those are kind of, come of some of my faves. And and actually uh, snowshoeing here in Minnesota. Yes, indeed. <laughs> Thank you so much, Carol. How about Ali? Uh, anything from you? Yeah, so mine, mine was also kind of where I originally thought I might be going with my career and then uh, ha changed pace, but um, I'm a big music lover. Uh, so I like to write music, I uh, love to perform. Um, I used to perform when I was at Castleton, but before that too, I actually got to, um, right around the time when I came to Castleton, I, I had the opportunity to sing the national anthem for the Boston Red Sox with a couple of my high school friends. Um, but also I was in a band with uh, my friend, Aaron Audette, who's also a Castleton graduate and still in the area. Um, and like to, you know, perform even at Castleton events when I can, the Castleton Gala and stuff like that. So. Um, that's certainly been a big part of my life. And I think, um, you know, helps, helps me in a number of other ways too, to decompress, um, and, and just have that kind of a fun hobby that's been with me since I was probably about 10. Something I share with my dad too, and he's on, he's on too. We like to sing together. So. Thank you so much, Ali. We've been graced with Ali's vocals at the Castleton Gala before. So we have, many of us have been <laughs> blessed with Ali's vocals. Um, I have a question for each of our panelists. Uh, Ariel, a fun question for you. Have you met the Gates? Uh, I have a very brief second of an introduction and a handshake back when we shook hands over. Thank you so much. Um, Carol, one of your areas of expertise is organizational transformation. Castleton and all of America's non-elite higher education faces enormous changes on the horizon. What advice do you have for any organizations uh, going through a period of transformation? Wow, that's a great question. Um, and actually well timed because at Medtronic, we're in the middle of uh, quite a transformation. And um, you know, kind of strategically, uh, structurally, and culturally. So I guess the, the advice that I would give is, um, you know, kind of be, be clear on what the strategic objectives and outcomes are. So what does success look like? What are you hoping to achieve? Uh, number one, um, 
and uh, ensuring that all that there's alignment across all of the parts. So in other words, there are when organizations go through um, transformations, um, sometimes it can sometimes it's done um, only structurally without all of the connective tissue, culture, um, process, how you do things and how you operate at a company. And so making sure that all of those things, including incentives, how people are promoted, how they're rewarded, how they're paid, are all aligned with some of your overall strategic goals and outcomes. And maybe the finally thing I would, final thing I would offer is um, transformations when, when done really well are, are multiple years typically that it will take to move large organizations through something so disruptive um, and um, especially culture, and we're we're just kind of beginning on the, the the first legs of our journey at that front. But typically, you know, setting expectations and making sure that people understand it's um, you know not a few month process, but typically over the course of a few years, and you know, being patient to track your progress, but knowing it's going to be you know more of a marathon versus a sprint. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Carol. Uh, Ali, a question about your position. Uh, working at a company who specializes in the area of defense, do you ever encounter classified or high priority information of that nature? Yes. Yeah, so I personally, in the role that I have, we do have a number of employees um, at our company who have security clearances and work on classified projects. I personally do not, um, but we, you know, that's obviously something that we have to be very mindful of, um, even in how we how we interact or exchange information within the company. Um, so yeah, that's certainly something, and I think it's it, we have a, a a very large engineering population, um, and so you can always tell when when it is one of those people that has their security clearance. Um, because they'll be very cautious about what they what they share or don't share. Um, but I personally am not one of those individuals. Thank you so much, Ali. I'll open this next question up to all of our speakers and I'll go right back to Ali. Um, reflecting back on your first year after graduating from Castleton, is there one thing that sticks out to you having entered the workforce that you say, I wish I would have taught that or I wish I would have learned more about that before entering the workforce? Yeah, that's a great question. I think uh, when I graduated, I had really high hopes that like I was just going to land this amazing job like right after being done. And I really quickly realized that if I was going to support myself and be successful, I might have to take on something that wasn't exactly what I was hoping for. And so I did that. And the biggest thing I think was I had to remind myself and I had to remind stuff that I learned from professors and others at Castleton, like just because you didn't find what you were looking for, like don't give up. And I kept exploring other opportunities and I had to wait a little bit longer than I wanted to, but like to have that resilience, I think is so important. Um, and I also just, I wanted to say, cause I saw Dr. Conroy's on the call. Um, he was one of those people who was really instrumental in mentoring me and stuff when I was at Castleton. And so I think just, you know, having that ability to be resilient and uh, stay the course um, and believe in yourself uh, so that you can get where you're trying to go eventually. Absolutely. Uh, Ariel, any thoughts um, from you about something that you didn't particularly learn in school, but you wish you would have known when entering the workforce? Uh, so a year after graduation, I was in the Peace Corps, uh, and I was based in a rural area, and it was kind of like, here's your job description, now go do it. Um, and I was under the Millennium Deve Development Goals program where we were trying to decrease infant mortality and maternal mortality. And I've gone through trainings, um, and I, I just really didn't know how to get going of it initially. And it took me about six to eight months to kind of get everything culturally under my, my belt, look, understand who my local leadership was, working with my counterpart. And I guess some, some of the skills that I didn't have were just how to 
uh, think about um, systems and how systems work, health systems and um, how they reach people. And that's something I had to like learn um, as I was living in it as a Peace Corps volunteer. Uh, and it's also something very specific. So not necessarily something that Castle Sing could have provided me with, but definitely something that I just didn't have an understanding, a depth of understanding with to complete the work I had been tasked to do. Absolutely, thank you so much. And Carol, how about you? I, you know, I think Allie, you know, gave great advice. I would, I would underscore and share the same that, you know, just be patient. Um, I remember being really frustrated and I was like, oh my God, am I ever going to get a job? Um, but, you know, persevere. The right thing will come along. Just be patient. And honestly, the first thing that popped into my head when you asked the question was, I had some, I was under some delusion especially probably after, uh, you know, four years of college and five years of graduate school, I was like, oh, at least when I start working, there will be no homework. I don't know what I was thinking. I was, I, I was just so dead wrong about that. <laughs> There's always homework. So just get that out of your head. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, another one for all of our panelists. Um, you, all, each of you spoke um, that a portion of your role involves some form of travel, both foreign and domestic. Uh, do you enjoy do you enjoy traveling for work, and how do you find a work life balance? Uh, Ariel, we can start with you. <laughs> well, I I love traveling. I've lived in a few places. I've been really fortunate in my career that I have been in other areas, and it's really um, taught me to uh, learn other cultures and share my own culture among uh, the folks that I'm with. And so I would say that traveling is a benefit to my job, but this year has taught me anything. If it's taught me anything is that it's not necessary per se to get my job done. Um, it's a great benefit, of course. Um, I probably travel five or six times a year uh, internationally um, with the Gates Foundation and I, I do enjoy it. However, it is it can be rigorous at times. Um, and in terms of balance, I don't believe in work-life balance. I think it's a juggle and you just have to take what's up in the juggle as you go through it and get through that and then move to the next board. And I really hope that what, I hope COVID has taught us all um, that we are human beings at the end of the day and we all have lives outside of, uh, of work. And that's one thing I'm really grateful for is that now I, I have a greater respect for my colleagues sad that it took the, the pandemic, but, you know, I understand that, you know, we're, we're all handling so much at one time and we see each other as our whole selves rather than uh, the person that came to work over. Absolutely. And before I pass that same question off to Carol, um, this is a great time, Ariel. We also had a question for you. Do you use your Spanish speaking skills um, in what you do at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation? Uh, unfortunately, the, um, the Gates Foundation does not have any programming in Latin America, which is something I have been really uh, trying to get them to invest in Latin America. Um, I do in terms of I'm um, a co-lead of the Latinos and Philanthropy Employee Resource Group, and uh, we support local organizations like the Northwest, uh, the Northwest Immigrants' Rights Project. So. The foundation has a, um, some funds that we can support local organizations and we were able to uh, support uh, organizations that were working at the border and currently are. And I'm, I'm able to help um, coordinate um, lawyers and uh, get aid to folks that really need it. And we also do, have done a local drive to support families here, uh, migrant families here in the Seattle area. Thank you so much, Ariel. Uh, Carol, on your work-life balance and um, if you enjoy travel as part of your position. Yeah, so maybe starting with the, the travel, um, you know, I would say I spent maybe a decade and a half in a permanent state of jet lag, just given the amount of travel and where I was living um, outside of the United States, all of my jobs, with, probably with the exception of Best Buy, um, have been really focused outside of the United States and, and loved it. Just sense of adventure, all the different cultures um, and, and, and the work was just exhilarating. But honestly, over the past year, you know, I was just talking with a colleague today. It puts a different lens on 
um, kind of the pandemic has put a different lens on quote unquote risk. And, uh, you know, I think that's going to, I think that's going to change the way we just, you know, as a society think about travel and everybody has a different level of tolerance for risk and how they code that and how they behave and, and all of that. So um, honestly, it's a question mark for me, you know, going forward, how much will I, will I be that, you know, air road warrior going forward or, or not uh, to be determined, but I absolutely cherish the time that I was able to spend doing that and, and loved it, loved every minute of it. I would agree there's um, no such thing as, as work-life balance these days. I think of it as more like work and life integration. How do the pieces of the puzzle fit together? How do you integrate it all, make it work? And um, I, again, you know, as, as women, I, I think we oftentimes um, put everyone and everything and everything else first, except ourselves. And um, what I've found, but I have to keep teaching myself this lesson over and over and over again, um, seems like every every few years. Um, if you don't do it, nobody else will. Period. Full stop. So for me, who someone is pretty structured, um, disciplined, um, uh, that means scheduling things. So I, I literally need to schedule, um, you know, when I exercise or or time that I need for myself. Otherwise the calendar will get away from me and I will be doing everything for everyone and ev everybody else except, except for me. So that's my advice is, um, you know, you have to take the time for yourself and if you don't do it, nobody else will. Thank you so much, Carol. Some great advice. Uh, Allie, any work-life balance tips um, and how you manage traveling for your position? Yeah, sure. So definitely my traveling has been stunted uh, due to the COVID pandemic, but I did do quite a bit of traveling, not as much international, but uh, my company has like over 30 sites across the United States. Um, and one of the businesses that I used to support is one of the most geographically dispersed. So I did get to do quite a bit of traveling. And as a comms professional, the one thing I've always been taught is if you want to get to know your stakeholders best, in particular, any of your senior executives traveling with them is sometimes the best way to do that. Um, and so that's something I've missed a little bit um, are those kind of deeper personal connections when you have the opportunity to just, you know, hey, you're, you got a layover in the airport and you get uh, an hour with somebody. It's just those types of conversations that you miss out on. But in a lot of ways, I think for me personally and for my company, uh, the pandemic has actually broken down uh, some of the geographical barriers um, to the point where now instead of having a meeting where 10 people are physically present in the location and a couple people are dialed in from a different time zone, it's leveled the playing field for everybody. And so that's one of the nice things about it. Um, and in terms of the work-life balance, I, I agree there. I've actually found uh, it's been a little bit more challenging in the virtual environment to find that work-life balance because the days seem to start earlier and they go a little bit longer. And so you do have to be very deliberate about how you, how you use your time, uh, whether that's professionally or personally. Um, and so I can resonate a lot with what Carol was saying about carving out that time for yourself because if you don't do it, man, it's gone like that. Absolutely, thank you so much, Allie. Um, and I know that Carol dislikes favorite questions, so I'm going to reword it <laughs> and say, do you have a most memorable Castleton experience? And I'll let Carol go last so that she can think about it. Um, but Ariel, do you have a favorite Castleton experience from your time here on campus? Um, I would say I was also part of Alternative Spring Break when I was at Castleton, and I did it for almost, I think every year I was at Castleton. And just the the support of the Castleton community for the community for Alternative Spring Break was uh, amazing. And I remember we would for one of our fundraisers we would do a pasta dinner um, where we would have donated items from um, Vermont artisans. And I remember uh, all of our professors coming to the pasta dinner and serving them. And it was just a great uh, event and. Uh, showed just how like the community, not just Castleton, they care so much about the community at large and our own uh, experiences as students and, 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 and participation and enriching experiences. 
Thank you so much, Ariel. Ali, how about you? Uh, most memorable, memorable experience here at Castleton? Yeah, sure. I kind of talked about this one a, a little bit um, during my part of the presentation, but um, there was a lot of like transformative things happening for the college right around the time when I was uh, nearing, you know, finishing up to include a number of expansions on the campus that we had just recently gotten a football team. Um, and so I, I got to write an article uh, with the Rutland Herald. It was my first byline. Um, when we did the groundbreaking for the new dormitories, uh, the newer dormitories, I should say now that are next to the football stadium. And that was like a really nice kind of closing out of my journey at Castleton and like segue into what was coming next, but still have a little piece of that. So that was something that was special to me. Thank you so much, Allie. Carol, a most memorable experience on campus. <laughs> Okay, well, for me, this was like a really long time ago, right? So this was like, you know, more than three decades ago. Um, it, it, so I, what I would say, honestly, is um, it really was just the council, just such great advice that I got there um, that I've already talked about uh, for my professors and the support. I didn't have the kind of the living on campus experience because I was commuting. I was I was working and uh, actually a few different jobs and commuting from my parents' house in, in Rutland. So I didn't necessarily have the, you know, the on-campus social experience, but it really is. But I mean, the best memory is just the door that it opened for me in life and in career. And I absolutely would not be here without having had that experience. And I'm really grateful for it. Thank you so much, Carol. Uh, I'll do one more question to all of our panelists before we open up to some final remarks. Uh, what is your hope for future women in the workplace? And I can start with Ariel. My future hope is, my current hope actually, is that more women are more vocal uh, in the work environment and have the confidence that, that we was alluded to earlier to take on those projects, to speak up um, in meetings. Uh, in some of the contexts I work in, uh, I've worked in, you know, I've been at the table, I've been the only woman in some instances, and I think that um, if we can, you know, help build a good coalition of women who can just rise up and speak and, and be heard, I, I think that that would be the best uh, solution to a lot of our problems uh, and having women in leadership positions, and I always will say um, to uh, some, a young woman to just go for what you think is not possible because um, it's putting yourself out there and, and opportunities will come to you if you have, if you just take them or have, or you grab them, grab onto them and take them over. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Ariel. Carol, any comments from you? Yeah, um, maybe I'll first start with some context. So at Medtronic, we have women in 40% of our leadership roles. Um, so manager and above roles. So 40% of basically, you know, 10,000, 11,000 roles around the world. It's good. But what I hope uh, to see is that women hold 50% of every level of leadership uh, going forward. There will come a day and that will happen. That is my hope, number one. And number two, my hope is that there is pay equity for every woman in every job at every level in the future. And again, I'm, I'm proud to say that at Medtronic and in the U.S., we have 100% uh, pay equity by gender in the U.S. and many countries around the world. But um, there are opportunities elsewhere for sure. Wow. Huge round of applause for Medtronic. That is absolutely amazing. Thank you so much for sharing. Uh, Ali, how about you? Yeah, I think um, similar to what Ariel and Carol have shared, uh, the industry that I'm in is a very male dominated industry. And so I think one of the important things is um, obviously looking up into the organization and seeing women in leadership roles, which I'm proud to say that my company uh, is doing very well in that arena too. Um, but also know that people are looking up to you no matter where you sit. Um, everyone's a leader in their own way. And so it's really important to pull the chair out for yourself and take your seat at the table, but uh, pull the chairs out for other people too and let, let them come with you because 
Um, it's if you support one another, um, you know, and, and find allies and different people, uh, that's going to be better for everybody. So. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Ali. That was some great, great comments. Um, now I'm going to open things up to our speakers one last time to give any last comments, anything you'd like to share that we didn't touch upon, uh, any words of advice. I know we have some students on this call, some people who are looking to enter the career field, uh, any advice for anyone um, looking to, to follow your lead. And I will start with Ali. Yeah, thanks, Courtney. I just want to say thanks again for having me on the call today. I've really enjoyed uh, talking with folks today and um, seeing a lot of familiar faces on the call. Um, I think my biggest piece of advice would just be, and, and I feel like we've kind of touched on this in a few times, but um, just believe in yourself. Like you are capable of doing things that you might not know that you're capable of. And so continue to push yourself and surround yourself with other people who believe in you or will push you to do those things. Um, I think we've all shared examples of, you know, when we've done that, how it's worked out well for us, um, or even if it's not in that moment, it might be down the road. Um, and so that's the biggest piece of advice I can give. Have, have that faith in yourself and you'll go far. Thank you so much. Ariel, how about you? I think Carol alluded to it best earlier in terms of a linear career path. Um, don't think that you have to have that path lined out that way, you know, um, and sometimes it, it's the opportunities that the small opportunities that come up that will make the biggest difference. So be open to, uh, you know, when they do come up and grabbing onto them and, and, and being brave and confident and courageous in yourself and, and uh, taking the path uh, least followed over. Thank you so much. Carol, any closing remarks? Yeah, probably just recapping what you've heard, I think, here this evening, which is, you know, one, um, have a plan, but be open to the detours and the unexpected things sometimes deliver the best experiences in, in life and career. Um, number two, I'll underscore what Ali said, you know, have comfort and confidence in your areas of competence. And number three, seek out sponsors, seek out their advice. And um, you've got great counsel. It's guided me well, and I'm confident that it will guide uh, many of those that are on the call who are students and, and seeking that advice. Thank you so much. A Spartan size thank you to all of our speakers this evening. You, you ladies were absolutely wonderful, and we cannot thank you enough for sharing your expertise with everybody on this call. A uh, huge round of applause. Thank you guys so much. Uh, anyone who's looking to connect with any of our speakers or alumni development office, I know everyone is on LinkedIn and I'm sure they'd be happy to continue some conversations and connect virtually uh, through that platform. And thank you again to everyone joining us at home tonight. Um, and I look forward to seeing everybody in some more virtual programming and throughout the rest of our Spartan activities. So thank you to everybody.